A super city. New York. As we have seen, Manhattan has fought a 400-year battle with water. That battle could become infinitely more intense. There are now scenarios that suggest that even uh, a force two or three hurricane in a situation where you had increased sea level could just devastate lower Manhattan, parts of Brooklyn, and most importantly, so much of the infrastructure that is below sea level, the subways, the steam tunnels, the electricity, would be flooded and potentially cause a disaster in the billions of dollars. Some experts have suggested an extraordinary solution. One proposal for preventing an enormous disaster is that we build tidal dams, actually three of them, one between New Jersey and Staten Island, one between Staten Island and Brooklyn, and then one up between the Bronx and Queens. So essentially using these three dams to cut us off from the open ocean. And these would then, in the case of storms, rise up and prevent the storm waters from coming in and flooding New York. There have been some tidal dams built. There's one in the Thames in England, uh, in Holland they've been built. But I think it would be an enormously expensive and complex project in the tens, twenties of billions of dollars it would be. But I think in many ways, more than the cost, the environmental implications uh, might well be a showstopper. Hey everybody, welcome to the IFC Media Project. I am Gideon Diego, and welcome to the future. So people, we will be able to control more of the news, but will we recognize it? The big shift we're seeing in news consumption is if you look at the baby boom generation, they basically consumed news at a fixed time in a fixed way. They had coffee in the newspaper in the morning or they had the 6.30 network news and a cocktail. Interesting that they used drugs to consume the news in both cases. But with the generation that's grown up on the internet, it's very clear that they expect two things. One, to be able to get news whenever and wherever they want. The second thing is a little uh, more abstract, but it's a notion that sometimes you hear millennials, this younger generation, phrase as, if news is important, it will find me. I think within 10 years, at least some of us will begin to wear goggles that allow us to see the world through clear glass, but which will project a computer screen at the bottom. You're able to walk around, look at the world through the glasses, and then touch a button or do a voice command, and now you can see the computer screen. So we will be that connected, I think, to the virtual world of news. The point that encourages me that you're suggesting is that industry sort of gets it now that they've put so much into some of these uh, small technological right. devices that they've got to start backing off. The, uh, the ease to operate issue is a real issue, one that they understand. I think that's absolutely true. And the way that they understand it is, for example, the return rates on products. That's something that they really notice. Uh, someone buys something at the store, brings it back for returns. It's turning out that for a lot of these electronic products, 50% of the returns, which they say they're broken and they want a refund, the product's actually running fine. The people just can't figure it out. So that's real bottom line problem. Or they suddenly find out that the you know <laughs> the device does a hundred or two hundred things, but they really only need three or four things on it to use. Right, right, and they can't find those three or four things. <laughs> In Korea in 2003, technology has already acted as an agent of change in politics. President Roh Myung-hoon, who was not seen as a probable winner, had, through the internet, managed to get quite a strong number of backers. And when events changed in the real world, a candidate dropped out, he was really able to capitalize on that, particularly because he had 800,000 cell phone numbers and was able to text them all the day of the election to remind them to vote for it. Australian politicians are also experimenting with interactivity and voters. There was a slate of candidates who ran as the Internet Senate, 
And they said that if elected, they would actually open up a discussion among everyone who voted for them and allow them to vote on Senate propositions, and then they, the senators in the Senate, would follow that vote. They didn't win, but it really planted a seed, I think. The global spread of interactivity in politics has yet to take flight until issues of security and identity are resolved in existing infrastructures. Interestingly, it could well turn out that, um, that younger countries with less well-developed infrastructures and less well-established methods of democracy may be the first to move towards much more uh, uh, e-democracy, direct voting, a lot of online participation, simply because they don't have the burden of an existing infrastructure, an existing voting system, and it may be a new enough government that you can change the Constitution to incorporate a lot of e-democracy.